Hello and welcome to our brand new series, The Best of Fintech. Now, over the course of the virtual trainer, we recorded a lot of content. And what we've gone and done is we've edited together the best snippets and stories that we thought from each region. Now, on today's episode, we're going to be looking at the best neobanks coming out of the Asia Pacific region. Now, I know a lot of them have already taken headlines before, but we spoke to them one on one in the virtual arena, and I'm really excited to showcase some of the stories here today in the best of fintech asia pacific neobank edition we spent a great deal of time thinking about why would a business like juro be needed in the market how could it survive and then how could it succeed and um and our strategic narrative uh today is exactly the same one it was four years ago and that's something i'm pleased about because it, too often businesses new businesses start with an idea uh, they develop a business plan and then, you know, a year or so later, it changes quite dramatically. And then, you know, and th sometimes I think that can be quite disconcerting from an investor point of view. There's a lot to be said about consistency of your strategic narrative and consistency in your pursuit and execution of a vision that you clearly mapped out in all its dimensions. Uh, when people see you doing that, they get an enormous amount of confidence. And certainly when we were raising this last round of capital that we announced last week, uh, the one thing that investors who came into the, that round said, look, you guys are doing exactly what you said you will do. Uh, you know, you've the, the consistency in execution, this consistency in vision, the consistency in the purpose behind the company, has uh, has been undiminished from from you know, way back four years ago. So quite often in a world where we are thinking about innovation, which is critical to any new business success, and technology changes a lot. So you can't say four years ago that we wanted a technological platform to look like this. But what you can see is that the core values and principles that you want your technology and the role of technology inside the company to perform uh, and you can outline those knowing that that, that innovation that, that changes and new technologies come on stream but the core principles and the role that you want technology to play um, should not change it should not change in the way you're building your company and in judo sense we said that we wanted to build a high tech and a high touch company we wanted a, a customer facing human dimension to the way we engage with our business customers but we wanted that to be enabled by leading cutting-edge technology cloud-based technology and so that when people came to do business with us it was easy for them to do business with us and it's easy for our people to do business with our customers and i think if you were looking and thinking about technology and your operating model sometimes tried and tested truisms hold up as the guiding philosophy and our, our guiding philosophy is easy to do business with. Generally speaking, there's a feeling that particularly on the SME side of things, they are underserved by the banks. Where else do you think that they are underserved in terms of kind of a product offering? Where else do you think there is kind of a, a, a gap possibly for Judo to expand in, into? Oh, I, I think there is, in my mind, there is no question that the, that the major banks, and I say this to be true of the UK too, have taken small to mid-sized businesses for granted over a number of years. Now, we are obviously, we've started focusing on lending because we saw in the, in the Australian context, there was a gap that is demand not met by the system of about $90 billion, so call it, call it 45 billion pounds. And the SMEs were basically being offered a, a one size takes all proposition from the banks. Uh, there was no innovation. There was, it was very automated. So there was no judgment being applied. And so the, our first thing was to demonstrate that we could grow our business by lending. Uh, the second thing then was to say, and we can help fund that lending through um, business and retail deposits, which we've done. We're, as, we're about 90% um, uh, loan to deposit funded. Now, <clears throat> the next thing is looking at the other broad range of products. So if you, if you think about foreign exchange 
and interest rate risk management, but foreign exchange in particular, the banks make excessive levels of profitability uh, in foreign exchange when it comes to dealing with small businesses and dealing with people like you and I. I mean, they, the rates that they charge and the margins they make and the return on capital um, is eye-watering. So we want to bring some real competition into the foreign exchange market. We also want to look at credit cards because again, banks make excessive levels of profits on credit cards. And then in the whole payments industry, you know, moving money around the system, facilitating uh, the, the, the smooth flow and transmission of money um, is a highly profitable business for the banks. And we think that, that small businesses have been taken for granted. They, they don't see the innovation that, that is available in the market. Um, and we want to address that as well. So our, our, our plans in terms of product development are extensive. Um, we, we'll, we'll, for us, the key was getting the Terminos technology platform uh, well and truly um, entrenched, deep roots inside the company. And then we could start developing our whole range of product suite, largely using that platform. Um, so there's a, there's a huge scope. I mean, the profitability that, that the banks make from small mid-sized businesses is um, excessive in the UK as, as it is here in Australia and we believe that we can make uh, build a very profitable business by bringing more competition by giving S small mid-sized businesses a much better deal than they're being offered and forcing the banks to kind of you know sharpen their pencil and, and offer uh, offer better terms and conditions better rates to small businesses so the opportunity is huge. It's, it's huge. Um, and I believe that the, the, this key to unlocking that opportunity is going to be innovative new players, whether it's pure fintech type models or neo banks uh, or more challenger bank, traditional based challenger banks. Um, they can transform this industry. Uh, they, they all share a common goal, and that is to disrupt the status quo, uh, the excessive profits and poor service that the, bank, the traditional banking system has earned and enjoyed um, and making a difference. And innovation will be critical to product development in that regard. And we will partner with some people. Um, I, don't, I don't see us doing all of this stuff on our own. We'll be looking for partners uh, that bring certain capabilities that, 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 um, that we would find it difficult to replicate, but could um, partner with them in a complementary manner. And, and, and those partnerships incidentally do not need to be confined to businesses that are currently based in Australia. I mean, I, I and my colleagues go to London two or three times a year to stay in touch with the, the, the so-called ecosystem, um, the innovation, the impressive innovation that is uh, evident in the London market in particular. Um, and, and we'll look to partner with people that can bring something to our business and allow them, of course, access to new markets. Um, and I, I very much see this as a very global industry. I don't, I don't see it as a national industry. It depends on capabilities um, to work together. Nuno, what, what's your viewpoint on the, on the market in Hong Kong? I mean, it's simple, and that's why, you know, if you think about the way we went about being global, uh, we went to the US first, that's where we're based. Um, then Europe, then Hong Kong. One simple reason is, and even there when we're looking at APAC, if you look at APAC as a region, and then Hong Kong in particular, what you see is they've jumped layers compared or, or stages compared to Europe or the US. You know, the way money moves around there, the way the contactless payments have been there for, you know, a decade plus now, where they're just starting in Europe and in the US, the way, you know, in some of the regions, the innovation around the way the apps are used. You know, you have, unlike in Europe or in the US, where we have many apps for many things, there you move money with messaging apps, right? So when we looked at it, we thought, well, this seems to be a market that's going to be ahead of what we're seeing on the more Western type of markets. They're going to leapfrog uh, this due to regulatory, a lot of innovation going on, but also the way just people operate. And we wanted to, to be there to learn, but also to bring our technology there and to help build, you know, this experience that puts customers at the center, where you have 
frictionless. It's all about experience. It's all about frictionless. It's all about how can you do your job without, you know, even being seen in our case, you know, making sure that risk is managed. We do not want to be seen. We do not want to do, you know, things like what you have in, in, in Europe or the US, second factor authentication and the kind of like messages and double passwords. That's horrible. So, and there we've seen that people are ahead. Uh, users, what they expect, what they're comfortable. And we just wanted to learn from that and want to be part of that because that's, I believe, a lot of the innovation in fintech and banking is happening in that region. And that's why, you know, we made a bet to go there about two years ago. We have almost 30 people in the region and we're going to grow there. You mentioned obviously FeedSize, one of your partners. Uh, Nuno, how, how is it working with those kind of targets in terms of elements like heart share as opposed to chasing break-even figures? Uh, the, way, the way I put that is, you know, I mean, let me let me let me tell you a story, and you know, and I'm, you know, the way we really like these partnerships to go through. When I first met, you know, some of the people at at uh, at Mox was, you know, in a place that reminded me, you know, these guys are going to build something really fast. And then, as I right, you know, about twenty months ago, think about this: in twenty months, you're able to create from scratch, uh, from an idea to a go live in a major market, sophisticated one, a product that is so innovative that you haven't seen that there. And you know, with, tech, with, with a clean technology stack, but with the goal, as Dennis was saying, of you know, onboard fast, give a good experience, because that's what brings people in. To us uh, at Feedline, frankly, that's kind of like the dream partnership. There have been cases with, let's call it, established players that they're trying to adapt, but they're oil tankers. It takes more time to negotiate a contract than it took, you know, mocks to go from idea to put a product on the market. Think about it that, think about it that way. It takes as long to negotiate a contract in some let's say established players because you have to go through all these things and it's just the way it's done to you know there's a vision there's a mission there's a statement let's get it out there let's bring the right partners that will enable us in that journey i call that wavelength that to us it's you know the favorite environment where we operate because it allows us to you know give value to work in tandem to share responsibility, that's very important because this is, you know, it's, it's a joint journey, right? I mean, we are, we collectively, there's a team. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a vendor or if you're, you know, the initiative, it's a team that is there that needs to deliver something. It's everyone together. That to us is so aligned with our core values that, you know, it's just natural to us. What is not natural is the, historical thing that you have that it, it will take forever you have to go through these long procurement cycles and i think the end consumer the the ultimate beneficiary of this does not get any benefit from that and it shouldn't be done like that and, and the industry needs to change and i think these the you know mocks in that region is spearheading that change and i you know that's the way i see it it's for the benefit of the consumer Absolutely. Well, Nunu, like, see, some of your customers love a mainframe. They love having central servers. What's it? Um, how is it working with obviously a bank, a, a speedboat bank that doesn't that has that kind of very cloud-focused approach? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, here's what's happened, uh, and and it's actually accelerating. Uh, as I was saying, I mean, you know, curiously enough, you know, Spotify is also one of our great uh, partners out there. Um, and it's the same rationale. I mean, they want to move fast, they want to get the best of technology, but more importantly, they want to do it in a light way. They want to do it in a way that you connect the APIs, you spun the service up, and you get benefit from it. As opposed to what historically was, it's all about control. You want to control every single thing. You want to control the machines, you want to control the connections, you want to control the physical cables. What has been demonstrated over and over that that doesn't work at the speed at which innovation needs to happen. So what we're seeing is now that 
you know, cloud is a given, it's work, it's safe. Yes, it has some risks, but the benefits, especially in today's world. I mean, think about it. We're supporting all of our clients in a fully distributed way. Why? Because mainly it's cloud-based, okay? And the ones that weren't, or even the ones that more recently, and you know, I, give, I could give you examples in Europe and in the US, uh, and even in Latin America, that were traditionally, no, 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 we need to control everything. It needs to be secured. We go to them and we demonstrate, not only us, but you know, the community says, look, here's the benefits of having on-prem, you know, server-based, mainframe, and there are some, and here's the downsides, and here's the benefits of being cloud first, you connect the APIs. And there's no one out there that can claim that the old way outstrips the benefits of the new way. So what we're seeing, even very hardcore, you know, even in countries that have been historically very conservative, there's a shift. Now, some of the shift is because you just have no option and you kind of like, you have to go with it. But a lot of it is driven by, you know, the likes of, of, of Mox, which is, they see, I need to get to my product out in this time frame. Just to procure the hardware, it will probably take you six months. To have the physical server that you control, it will take you another. For what benefit? No benefit. Because the reality is, I also believe that what this allows is to, you know, uh, innovative banks like, you know, Mox and whatnot what is, if tomorrow another vendor comes up with a better solution for a given product, they'll just rip and replace because it's a connection of APIs. And I think that makes, you know, even feeds and others, makes the, the, the makes it more honest. You're not gonna be, you know, uh, uh, oh, it's deployed there, it took me five years to put it there, I'm not gonna take it out. No, you have, you, you have to earn it every day. And the, and the APIs and the systems cloud-based, as they're easier to disconnect and connect, it makes everyone strive for a continuous better product. Me personally, and the way we you know set up and the way we like to work, we you know we love a good challenge and, and we love to, to have that. And I think that's the way it should be globally. So there's no turning back on that movement. No, no, you obviously you work again with banks all over the world. Um, what's your viewpoint on the sort of success rate of these uh, sort of speedboat banks, and, and which ones do you think are the are the ones that seem to be absolutely knocking it out of the park? I mean, I see, you know, you mentioned N26, they're, they're another of one of our good, good partners. And I see differently, I see two things. And, and even some of them are, let's say, analogous to our journey at Feedzai. There are the, the banks that, you know, the challenger initiatives that are sponsored by a main bank or that were spun out because, you know, they have to do things faster and whatnot, but they start by bringing in a lot of the main knowledge with a desire to innovate and then the engineering knowledge. That is, in my view, a better team from the get-go. Because other challenger banks or other type of, you know, uh, speedboats, they start, you know, uh, from an engineering mindset, typically VC-backed, and they'll probably go faster in the beginning but they will make many mistakes, in my view, that the other ones that come from the domain and have that industry knowledge will not make mistakes. So what I'm seeing is, you know, it's to me that the, 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 the winners will be those who can get the, the mix and the teams the fastest. The domain knowledge that will really know how to operate in banking to create that trust that Dennis uh, was mentioning and while at the same time building the tech stack and innovating and, and putting products out there that the market wants faster. It's natural that, you know, someone will not succeed. You know, it's kind of a wild west out there in terms of, if you go and look at the number of challenger banks in the different regions, not all of them will succeed. It just, there will be consolidation at some point and it's just a natural thing. But to me, the best combination and the ones across uh, you know, the globe that we're seeing is those that combine two. And you also see that in the, in the ones that started, you know, traditionally VC back, how fast and how, you know, uh, they are trying to hire that domain knowledge that prevents to make sure that they are, they are regulatory compliant, that they have their AML mechanism. There have been a number of news where, you know, some of them, um, you know, they didn't have the proper AML compliances in place. 
and then you have to speed up to, to build them and that you know that caused trust issues with them right so to me that combination and we're also seeing that in some initiatives in other regions is do you have the domain knowledge the people that come from the industry that they know how these institutions will have to operate once they get to a steady state with the engineering know-how and the, and the innovation know-how that allows them to get really fast there. Those will be the ones that will succeed in my view. Let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, what kind of led to you creating uh, Walrus? You know, start from the beginning if you can. Sure, sure. So uh, I uh, personally, I have been an entrepreneur for the last uh, 10 years or so. And as an entrepreneur, I have faced, um, I, I've been through like uh, rough times where uh, I have I have had no money for expenses and all. And uh, what the real, realization I had come to is it's all due to bad financial planning. You you uh, if you if you do not take care of your finances and do not plan properly, do not have financial uh, discipline, uh, you you get into a problem. And uh, in India, India is a bit conservative country. And uh, unlike the West in India, parents, uh, uh, like the children stay under the hood of the parents for, for a longer period. Right? So, so in India, parents uh, push the children to focus on their education till they get their job and, uh, and uh, they take care of all their uh, needs till then. Right? So, but uh, the, like the problem with this is the child doesn't learn basic financial management, doesn't know how to uh, like say budget, how to that he should uh, look into earning money, that he should look into investing money. So, so when he gets into his first job, he doesn't and starts earning, he doesn't know what to do with the money. So, uh, so, so we think like uh, like in India also like only two to three percent of people have insurance. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, I think like uh, now a lot of people have bank accounts, but hardly anyone invests. Uh, people do not. Uh, take insurance people do not uh, create goals or save money for their future use uh, so so all of these uh, leads to a lot of problems that uh, and uh, by the time people realize that they are not taking care, care of their finances uh, properly it's already too late so 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 we we thought of like introducing money to children at a younger age so that they know uh, how to be smart with money from a younger age so that when they start earning money they it's already uh, they are already disciplined and it's a way of life for them. Right? So uh, at Walrus, we are not building like a education platform or like a video series where children, uh, where uh, people learn about financial literacy. We, we are building a tool which if you use, you are already financially disciplined. Right? So, so our platform makes it very easy and fun to manage money. Like uh, it, it's, it's secure so that parents can give money to to children without having to deal with cash and uh, for children it's it's that instagram or snapchat experience that is here so so you you have fun while dealing with money you have fun saving money you have fun uh, investing money or creating goals or creating budgets uh, so, so we we bring that fun experience into banking and since it's uh, and uh, this is something uh, i mean like for, uh, since we are very focused on this instagram generation we we know what they like, what they understand, so so we can tailor make things uh, really for them. And kind of taking a, a step back and looking at the kind of financial industry as a whole. Now, one thing that's been characterised over the last couple of years, obviously, has been open banking and the sharing of data between financial institutions. Um, one thing I'm really interested in is the um, sharing of data within uh, by customers. Um, for instance. Generation X, the millennials, um, have shared a lot of private data to their friends that potentially, the, you know, previous generations would almost be appalled that their friends are sharing photos of them, going out, having parties, everything like that. How long do you think it's going to be? Um, and and yeah, obviously this is just purely your opinion, but till um, Generation X is very handy and very open with sharing their their, what they're spending on and maybe um, almost like Instagram, they're seeing what their friends are buying, almost like a kind of like um, a, a scroll down list and you can see, as you said, your friend, like one of your friends has gone to Domino's and you could comment on that. I mean, do you think that's in the next couple of years, perhaps? No, so we, uh, we, we have that feature in our app. 
Oh wow! So, so when you when you make a purchase, so so most of the purchases uh, that these kids are doing today are by scanning QR codes yeah. uh, at at the merchant uh, stores. So, so we we have this feature where you can scan the QR code uh, and you can take a photo of yourself and send it to your feed. Uh, so, so the Waldus app has a feed of its own where you can see what your friends are sharing, and you can also share it to Instagram if you want. Um, so, where a broader audience get to see see that. Right? Uh, so, so we 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 are adding more more fun things to to that, uh, where not only you can uh, like uh, add a picture, but you can check into a place as well. You can uh, you can see who else purchased from that same place, like. Uh, when when was the last time a friend of yours came to that place? So 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 a lot, lot of fun fun things where you know it's it's not just about payments but like the whole experience uh, altogether. So I've I've got to ask you know you're talking about customers coming back and everything like that. This Walrus is designed for teenagers. Now you know, you've recently said that that Walrus shouldn't really be used for anyone post the age of twenty two. You know um, what what does that mean and and do you think that you know where should they go next effectively um or will you be offering up a suite for those people later on in the in the future right right so so our idea is that uh, i mean we we are in like a bit uh, early stage of our product development sure so, so we think like a uh, 20 year old or a 22 year old has a uh, bit of a different uh, expectations they have higher expectations than what we have in the product right now so, so we uh, so, so right now we we want to cater to the below 18 age group and try to serve them well, and um, which which uh, and like a 17 year old today will become 18 year old tomorrow. So, so we we want to grow up with our uh, users. So, so so we we want to bring in products for young adults as well, which will cater to say up to 24, 25 years of age. Um, but like that's coming next. We we don't have it. Uh, that don't have those features right now which will satisfy a 24 24 year old sure. so so that's why we restrict it to them restrict it uh, based on age so that we do not like um, underwhelm a 23 year old sure now i mean that leads me to ask the question you know what makes walrus unique for teenagers i mean we've talked about that brilliant uh, kind of sharing that very social aspect, which I've never heard of in a financial organization before. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but what makes you, uh, Walrus unique for teenagers, especially compared to typical mainstream banking apps? Right. So uh, the mainstream bank accounts are not really uh, catering to this age group. They are meant for adults. So if you uh, if you open an account with, uh, so one is like they do not allow the teenagers to open accounts. So you need your parent to open an account and uh, with COVID and all, going to a bank is just a no-no right now. So, so there is no digital way they can actually uh, open open an account easily. And even if they manage to open an account, say with the help of their parent and all, uh, it doesn't meet their uh, expectations. Like so, it's cluttered. Like uh, the banking app that's meant for uh, the adult will be cluttered with like say investment options, uh, insurance, loans, everything which has. Which is not relevant to to this uh, age group. Right? So what we have done is like we uh, and uh, design and everything is is not like not meeting the expectations of uh, the Instagram generation. So, so what we have built is a very simplified uh, yet uh, very uh, like uh, very high bars in terms of design. Uh, so so and like cool uh, and social. So so we want like your friends to be there as well. So. So you can create groups and uh, make group payments. You say uh, five of you go to a restaurant together. You can like split your bill easily. Uh, so so those kind of features uh, or like say your friend's birthday is coming in a month. So you can uh, and 10 of you are going together. Then you can save money for that friend's um, birthday that's coming or you want to go on a trip together. So so, so we, we have uh, talked with these users and uh, built in a lot of features which a bank is not going to ever build because uh, they they are going to cater to their mainstream users, and uh, they they are going to look at what is adult looking at. The adult is looking, hey, what do I do about my retirement? What do I uh, what do I do? How do I take a housing loan? How do I take a bike loan? So so these these are not relevant to to a child. Uh, so a child is worried about buying books, going to a restaurant, seeing a movie. Uh, 
uh, and uh, so so these are the perks uh, or rewards and other things that we build uh, for for this age group as well as uh, we try to bring the social features in we try to focus on design and uh, make sure everything is seamless uh, we we have like a rewards network which is just for uh, just for teenagers right? so if i use if if i am a child and i use my parents card the points or the rewards go to my dad he is probably going to get a a uh, free airport lounge access or he's going to get some uh, points to buy petrol uh, and i'm not happy with that i want my own reward points yeah. so so we we work with merchants that are focused on uh, teenagers be it like a movie or be it uh, i want to learn badminton i want to learn swimming uh, i want to be an entrepreneur i want to learn about that i i want to learn boxing or i want to go uh, abroad for uh, my uh, like um, my future education so i i want i need some help with that so so these are the things that we aggregate and bring together into our ecosystem and uh, as you spend you get reward points which you can use at these merchants so these are some of the things that a bank will never do because uh it's, it's too much for them what is it what's the story what was the moment that we thought aha there's a big problem out here how are we going to solve it yeah um so um Sack Finance is essentially a fintech product. We are a fintech startup, essentially into personal finance domain. Now, um, um, as you asked, it was not really a eureka moment for uh, me or anybody in the team for us to come up with this idea of Sack Finance. Actually, it was very intuitive over the time for us because uh, we've been on that journey of you know. Um, you know basically managing money investing specifically so i personally do not come from a finance background i am an engineer uh, but uh, was really a savvy investor into the stock market and that's when i started using a lot of products around you know trading investments uh, mutual funds are really popular in india banking credit cards debit cards etc and that's when i realized how difficult it is to manage money for somebody who's already versed with personal finance now forget about people who do not even know about finance or how to manage it so there were a lot of people who used to come to me uh, including my family members even friends while i was in college to uh, you know ask about where should they invest how should they save uh, what insurance to buy etc and that's when i uh, started realizing that you know um, how uh, complex it seems for uh, an average person somebody who does not really come from that background or understand finance to manage money something which should not be a luxury so i think that's the only thing we had in mind we um, so yeah after that i guess uh, i met my um, you know founding members uh, over the time and we started ideating on this thing what if there was a product that could you know actually automate all of this actually uh, you know manage money or make uh, money work for people instead vice versa so um that's how stack finance came into being but yeah i mean um, interesting story before uh, actually making stack finance we used to do this offline so um similar personal finance service but uh, more in offline or a physical uh, you know uh, model uh, rather than a tech product i know we talk about this a lot but in uh, we say that at school you're taught quadratic equations you're not taught what a mortgage is you're not taught what a share is what a stock is um why why do you think that is why do you think as a, as a society we kind of almost shy away from that level of of financial education because that seems to be the first stage towards financial health is understanding what uh, what what your what your needs are and and what the solutions currently are I think um I think there are a lot of loopholes in the education system not just about you know finance there are a lot of other things also which are important um now all our lives you know i mean it's so ironic that all our lives whether it's in school or college we're taught things that would help us or facilitate enable us to make money eventually to ultimately then fulfill whichever goal we have but unfortunately nobody really talks about how to then manage that money so i think they just kind of cross check that first goal that you should be able to make money but then how to manage how to grow that money how to um, kind of eventually be able to in, in fact be financially independent uh, in your life nobody really teaches you that somehow i think i guess i'm not really sure but i think uh, uh people uh, or the educational institutes they just believe that you know your family members are going to teach you about all of this or you're going to learn eventually in your life or maybe i don't know going to experiment with your money 
but that should not be so it's a basic essential it should be taught right in the school at least in the college if not uh, in school but i guess yes uh, nobody really talks about it there's no formal system of really educating people or uh, students about money finance personal finance especially so yeah i think there is a gap for some reason i don't know really i've never been able to figure out why it does that exist where do, does the stack come in in terms of actually kind of educating people around well first of all what personal finance is yeah so um uh, stack finance is essentially i would say a super money app that kind of handles everything around your personal finance and money so it does not essentially mean just your bank accounts or even just investments it's everything that you would do with your money including your savings your cash your um, assets your liabilities investments credit card debit card bank accounts everything you know together in just one single app so that's why also it's known as stack finance stacking everything together um essentially um it is basically i'm not sure whether you've heard of mint in us i think it's very popular uh, there oh yeah yeah so if you have heard of it, if you might have used mint you know that you know it aggregates all your financial data in one place where you can get a 360 degree view of your personal finance or you know your financial lifestyle in general but i think one thing that that kind of lacks and the reason i'm trying to bring the analogy of mint is so that it is much more clearer i think one thing that i find lacking in mint is that you cannot really execute things so for example if i am able to understand that you know my liabilities are much greater than my assets now what to do about it how should i go about solving this problem nobody really uh, kind of solves the problem for you so i think stack is basically an aggregation per plus um, an execution platform uh, which is but uh, even more personalized and automated for an individual let's talk as well so with all of this information and be able to have that complete view of an individual in terms of their assets in terms of their spending um what's the opportunity there for uh, for revenue yeah um so i think uh, a lot of new banks are struggling with their revenue streams or um i mean um especially i think a lot of new banks have also dipped their valuations because of the same and especially given all this situation of covid and all um i think the uh, one of the blessings in disguise for us was that in india you're not really allowed uh, to you know uh, they do not really provide a virtual banking license or a digital bank or a neo bank so, so you know you typically cannot be a literal neo bank here in india you really have to partner with banks or anything to kind of pro, um, you know provide services around neo banking so that's a blessing in disguise because uh, we started with that uh, motive you know to be a bank and to to you know kind of provide the transparency make more uh, services accessible and affordable for people but then we realized that uh, it's very difficult if you're not a bank so um we tweak the business model a bit and it is it's really uh, it's been really good for us it's worked really good for us because revenue streams are uh, we do not really rely upon one particular revenue stream in that manner so we uh, kind of work with a lot of partners who are already banks who are already brokers or uh, you know various uh, various other financial institutes also who we work with to provide the products uh, to the users so we aggregate those uh, you know services together then depending on the profile of the user uh, we uh, you know basically give them options that you know maybe these three bank accounts will work good for you or maybe uh, these are the mutual funds that you would want to buy uh, etc so given that um, revenue streams are diverse and uh, and basically uh, they have we have a layered revenue stream in that manner so there are there are some trail revenues that we get so for example if people are making any payments any bill payments especially um these become our trail income methods because then it's occurring each and every month similarly if people have sips systematic investment plans um uh, that is also a trail revenue or a trail income stream for us then there is second is we have affiliate uh, revenues affiliate product revenues so by which i mean if uh, you know if uh, if a person does not already have a bank account does not already have a trading account we get it opened for them through our partners now for each and every uh, you know uh, lead that we give to these partners in turn we get revenue so that's the affiliate revenue stream we have 
plus uh, for the intelligence that we're creating on the platform there is a uh, an additional charge for that so there's a premium model as well where a premium subscription model where we give more personalized services like built in portfolios depending on your goals depending on your risk profile um that is something we explicitly um, we actually charge for as an advisory fees and all so i think those are some separate revenue streams so you know that is how we monetize various services on different levels well, you mentioned a lot about about uh, automation there what's the um what's kind of the the moonshot i mean you the sound of things are, are you looking to almost be in a position kind of like kind of like we lab where you've got a handful of people with 200 plus million customers what's kind of the uh, the moonshot the end the end goal um the end goal itself is i think the vision that we have while we were creating stack um um is basically again to have something um so we call it stack coach uh now i want to create a stack coach kind of figure which is basically like a personal finance manager sitting in your pocket so you just tell him a few things about yourself you know this is my this is my entire financial lifestyle this has been my history in like three or four lines and it should be able to take care of everything else for you uh, from then uh, from that moment it should be extremely personalized it should know you really well if you are you know if you're doing recurring expenses it should be able to tell you if you are uh, if you let's say if your investment portfolio is not enough diversified if you are if you are let's say uh, not able to track your money each and every day it should be able to do that for you so that's the level of um, personalization i want to achieve so you know personal finance ironically right now is not really personal it's very much generic you know the products right now uh, that are available in the market they are much like menu apps marketplaces they give you thousands of options and you just are then confused or you're left to figure out yourself but i just want to create this particular figure um, and i just had this you know this is like a dream to create stack coach which is uh, which is for everybody a for personal finance manager something which a lot of millennials right now in india are not able to afford um so i just wanted to make it so personalized and scalable that everybody can avail that kind of a service without much uh cost could you give our viewers really pre pandemic what were some of the maybe kind of key issues facing small to medium sized businesses yeah certainly so i think that uh you know pre pandemic uh the working capital gap or the demand for working capital kind of stood around about sort of 90 uh, 90 billion dollars and that increased by a further 13 billion and so you know we think about the kind of current kind of credit models that traditional lenders or banks would use to try and assess the picture of a of an SME or or assess risk it would be um pretty pretty inflexible and pretty pretty wooden and so they wouldn't have an accurate picture of a business up to date uh, in order to understand you know their their current position Um, and so i think those are some of the key issues that a lot of um, i'd say kind of you know SMEs would face and a lot of the um a lot of, a lot of banks um would ultimately impose on some of these SMEs as well yeah how important is having an increased visibility um or even control of finances going to be for businesses going forward i know it sounds almost obvious that you know having that visibility is you know incredibly important but you know what are we going to start seeing in terms of helping businesses get better visibility of their own finances. I think I think what we're going to start seeing is a is a shift in and especially what we're doing here at Cape is a shift in really some of the the products available to them um how easy it is to get access to some of those products. So, you know, I think one of the key issues that we find with lots of SMEs are around, you know, cash flow um and access to to, to capital and the ability to try and surface some of this through some of our products especially our cash flow forecasting analytics tools at the best of times it can be very very difficult for a business to understand you know what their position is you know what their forecasted sales might be especially during a pandemic like now uh, and so i think that's that's really where we're trying to try to try to take this uh, and trying to kind of you know enrich the experience for SMEs around not just the line of credit but the ability to to understand what they're what they're spending how they're spending Uh, and kind of i guess improve their confidence around that what were some of the defining characteristics of business banking before covid you know why did businesses and banks of both like just settle for this kind of um kind of 
failed offering, really? I think it's, it's an interesting, interesting question. Sorry, I, um, I think there's just been this kind of one size fits all approach for, mm. for business banking. Um, it's always been, it always seems to be last to, to have kind of any kind of product extensibility or, or innovation. Um, and and to be completely honest with you, I think that's that's been one of the key defining characteristics of, of business banking. And, and to be quite frankly, still is. I mean, you know, even, you know, Ryan and myself setting up our business bank account in Australia took months and it was a long and quite painful process. Um, you know, it, it, the, the back and forth, having to kind of send documents, um, scanning in different things, the, the, the requirement of, of wet signatures, etc. So, I think there there is a there is a massive opportunity to make sure that we can um, improve that entire process. Um, yeah. And we know that a one size fits all um, approach just really doesn't work. You know, businesses are extremely unique. They have different characteristics depending on the industry, and I think all of these need to be catered for. Um, you know, I, it, it means that you can create lots of different interesting propositions to help serve uh, different different parts of the market and serve them well, as opposed to trying to kind of have this all encompassing um, kind of, you know, product that doesn't really work for anybody. Uh, it's probably better to have a product that works for a particular segment. Well, um, with that in mind, could we, yeah, I want to turn the questions kind of more towards CAPE and, and what you guys are doing. So um, you've obviously given our viewers a, a bit of background to what you do, but how how does CAPE look at this data and, and how do you action it differently to maybe some of the more traditional institutions we've seen in this in business banking before? So at CAPE, what we're, what we're doing is that we're looking at alternative um, uh, data sets, right? So we're looking at the I guess the foundational sets as well. So we're pulling in all of the uh, the data from credit bureaus uh, and pulling all pulling all of the data around the business uh, to to understand them. Um, but also looking at potentially kind of you know vertical or industry specific data as well. So you know specific to them, if they're a you know a SaaS business as an example, you know we're looking at their invoices to understand their realized revenue or unrealized revenue. Sorry. So you know, they've sold a contract to another business or some licensing to another business for, for a year. At six months in, there's six months of unrealized revenue and we're trying to pull that into our credit model to understand and try and underwrite that company. And I think that's where we're trying to um, really innovate on some of these uh, credit products. Uh, and the same goes for, you know, whether it's an e-commerce company and we're trying to have a look at some of their trading data or trading history that comes out of the e-commerce platform. That's where I think it gets really interesting uh, and we can really set ourselves apart and differentiate from, from a traditional lender or bank. So, I mean, speaking of that, I've got to ask, you know, what's next for Cape? Um, so I think for us, the, the main thing is, I guess, working towards launching our MVP end of Q1 next year. Uh, that's the main thing uh, where, you know, we're right now kind of just plugging away, um, kind of, you know, building out, trying to stand up the first version of the product. Um, and hopefully before that, so um, right at the beginning um, of, of Q1. Uh, so end of Jan, hopefully we'll do a soft launch of our rewards platform for an early adopter cohort, which will be, which will be interesting to try and try and engage and try and drive up those customer numbers. So that's, it's going to be a busy, busy start to the year. I mean, it's going to be busy into the year as it is, but uh, that's, that's what we're working towards at the moment. Well, Edo, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, well, I, I wish you the best of luck and a, a Merry Christmas and a, and a Happy New Year.